welcome to Saturday Morning Trek. It's an exciting time for Star Trek fans, and if you'd like to help Trek FM keep engaging discussion coming your way each and every day, consider becoming a patron of the network through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. This is DC Fontana. You're listening to Trek FM. Future's here for us to see. It's 2280. Their mission to fight injustice, to right that which is wrong, and to boldly go where no man has gone before. It's Saturday morning trek. Join us at Trek FM as we hearken back to the days of wood panel dens, console televisions, and space cats. Uh, no, not not Emrets. The other space cat. No, not the Lamacha. No, no, not the Capellan Power Cat. No, not the Videlit. Look, wow, there are a lot of animated series cats. I'm Aaron Harvey, and what you probably can't tell from that intro is that today we're going to be reviewing the animated series episode, The Slaver Weapon. And joining me today is Joe Slepsky of the G.I. Joe podcast, Joe on Joe. Hey, Joe, welcome back. Hey, Aaron, thanks for having me, man. You're welcome. Um, this w- we had a lot of uh, really good response to when you were on last time, and since Adam is is uh, pushing the papers and and all the stuff that he's doing at Paramount right now, we thought we'd uh, have you in as a little little bit of a fill in. And I am honored and flattered, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, Saturday morning Trek fans. I appreciate the kind words. Well, did you see a bump in uh, Joe on Joe? <laughs> um, you know what? As a matter of fact, I did. You did? I Great. did. I did. Nice. You know, Joe on Joe has a, uh, well, it's very similar to your show, but I, I, I'm not seeing your numbers because my show is uh, kind of a legacy show. Oh, okay. Because, you know, because it's about the whole series, we go episode by episode, oh, right? right? So we, yeah. we watch every episode and, we, and it's a watch together show. Mm-hmm. So we all watch it together. I don't do a lot of like new news or discussions of like that it's really about watching the the star of the show is gi joe right um so when i get a bump which i totally did from your show thank you very much the bump's not often on our episode it's very often on like older episodes yeah i've yeah. noticed that yeah 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 so so yes i've totally got a bump and i appreciate it but it's it's just fun going back and a lot of people like to watch countdown for zartan huh that's interesting <laughs> I'm trying to remember what is that was before he came on like it was like uh, it was one of the it. it was actually I think the reason is it was actually one of the very first episodes of the regular show um, specifically oh, okay. I believe it was the first episode and so a lot of people saw that and it was on VHS which they back then they didn't put all the shows on VHS so like that's a show that and there's a handful of other ones uh, satellite down would be another one that everyone as a kid saw a billion times so that's right. totally got to be a fan favorite and it's got zartan's name in the title so even if you don't remember it you're like oh i remember zartan let me watch that so i remember zartan being flogged on television like buy this toy buy this toy buy this. it's like oh yeah okay zartan's he, here we get it <laughs> he changes color in the sun yes <laughs> Master of disguise, Sartan changes color right before your eyes. Sartan introducing Sartan. I think him and uh, Sergeant Slaughter; those are the two, the big oh, ones that I remember. Like they must have paid the real Sergeant Slaughter so much money to be a part of their their universe. Honestly, they flogged him. They used him so much. Yeah, he remember at once he joined quote joined the team. He then would introduce the cartoon. That Joe's surrounded by cobras. Yeah, but that Joe, Sergeant Slaughter, he's joined the GI Joe team. So we're celebrating by giving away Sergeant Slaughter action figures. But you can't buy them in stores. You've got to earn them. Joe. Nobody takes on Cobras better than Sergeant Slaughter. Sergeant Slaughter was all over it, and it had to be because they, they they must have paid him so much money. Well, and I'm sure it helped also advertise wrestling at the same time. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, what was bigger than wrestling? And it, yeah. it kind of soured on him when he was still a part of the Joe team, and then he took a heel turn in the wrestling world. Oh. And he, he teamed up with, like, the Iron Sheik. It was Uh-oh. during the, like, uh, the, the beginning... Rank? The beginning of the first Gulf War, you know? Yeah. And he was <laughs> he was like hanging out with the Iron Sheik. Uh, I don't think we need you on the G.I. Joe team anymore, Mr. Slaughter. No, that I, I could see that being a... <laughs> There's a lot of things that we could say about modern political life. I will not mention it. But oh, like... sure, yeah. <laughs> 
So today we're going to talk about The Slaver Weapon, which is the episode written by Larry Niven, famous science fiction writer, um, that adapted one of his stories into a TOS episode or TAS I, episode. Sorry, I did not. I did not know that. So this was a story that he already wrote, like the, a concept that he already had conceived. Yes. So basically, there were three uh, kind of iterations of how this story went. He first uh, kind of pitched a story about quantum black holes, uh, which later he turned into another story, I think, um, and this really alien-looking species that was sort of like a black cat o' nine tails with photoelectric metabolism. What? Yeah. I mean, like, they wanted different looking aliens. That's different looking. Sure, yeah. Um, and basically Dorothy was like, no, that's that's not going to work. <laughs> 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 and his second attempt, which I don't know much about, was just deemed too bloody. So... <laughs> I feel like any blood, unless yeah. it's coming out of like Kirk's nose slightly, is too bloody. Yeah, I, I think maybe, yeah. I, I, even when there's a medical issue, I don't think there's even blood. So. No, no, no. I, I, I believe, I believe, bo I believe Bones, a... would, Bones would refer to them as savages. Like, you deal with blood? Yeah. Savages. <laughs> I think it actually might have been a network children's oh. television law kind of thing. I'm I bet. sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah. Uh, so basically, while at Gene Roddenberry's house one afternoon, uh, Gene basically suggested the story to Larry. It's like, here, uh, it's the soft weapon, which I guess had been recently at that point reprinted. And um, that's the this attempt. That story became this uh, this episode. So um, interesting. Yeah. So before Did we you begin. So have you have you read the soft weapon? I have not. Actually, I'm interested. I've not been a. a I feel like I should be a big Larry Niven fan, but I never really got into Ringworld, which is his yeah. his most well known uh, story. And I I started Lucifer's Hammer, which I believe, if I'm not confusing my stories, is sort of about like a, a extinction level event. Um, oh, it was also that was also my nickname in high school, <laughs> Ellie um, <laughs> Lucifer's Hammer. Oh, Lucifer's so, Hammer. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, what I'm wondering is, is uh, so his story, did his story revolve around the gun or did his story revolve around those awesome boxes that freeze time and can can only sense each other? Do you know which one? Both of those. Oh, OK. Yes. So before we begin, though, let me give everybody a, a synopsis of what's going on so they know I'm, what you're talking about with these. I'm jumping ahead. Magic box. That's OK. It's called a teaser. It's a teaser. Yes. Hang on for the magic boxes. That's another <laughs> another name for a band. We've got Lucifer's Hammer and the magic boxes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're playing tonight at the Double Door. Aboard the shuttlecraft Copernicus, Spock, Sulu, and Uhura are en route to Starbase 25 where they're to deliver an exceedingly rare piece of technology the Stasis Box, constructed by the long-vanished spacefaring race known as the Slaver Empire. About a billion years ago, the Slavers conquered and ruled most of the galaxy until they became a casualty of war themselves. During its heyday, the Slavers carried valuables, including highly advanced weaponry, inside the Stasis Boxes where time stood still. Some previously discovered Stasis Boxes have contained technologies capable of revolutionizing science, including the gravity plating on starships. Stasis boxes also constitute the only means, other than pure chance, of finding another stasis box. During the voyage to Starbase 25, the stasis box aboard the Copernicus begins reacting to the presence of a second box somewhere nearby. Spock takes the shuttlecraft to an inhospitable icy world in the Beta Leary system to investigate. After determining that a second stasis box lies 30 meters below the planet's frozen surface, Spock, Sulu, and Uhura are surprised by a group of Kazinti, sentient, meat-eating, cat-like predators who take them captive. The Kazin reveal that they possess an empty stasis box, which they stole from a museum, and have used to bait and lure another stasis box into their clutches, one they hope will actually contain a weapon capable of restoring the Kazinti Empire to the power and influence it had once enjoyed previously to its fateful run-in with humans over the past two centuries. Chuffed Captain, the leader of the Kazinti Raiders and commander of the Traitor's Claw, finds several innocuous items inside the stasis box, including a photo of the slavers and a piece of raw meat, which is as fresh as it was a billion years ago when it was put inside. Oh, a pistol with several power settings. Aware of how dangerous an item like this could be in the wrong hands, Spock, Sulu, and Uhura attempt to escape and recover the weapon, which contains an artificial intelligence that insists on being given a prearranged code word before it activates. With Sulu's assistance, the weapon explodes and destroys the Kazinti along with the traitor's claw. 
As the Enterprise officers return to the shuttlecraft to resume their journey to the starbase, Sulu expresses regret that the slaver weapon couldn't have been salvaged, but Spock points out, however, that the device may have been too dangerous for anyone to keep. And then Uhura kind of laughs at the Kazinti's death. The end. That's basically the, the long and short of it. Um, and you were saying, you know, we're talking about the, the magic stasis boxes. And stuff. Yeah. That is, I, it is a very cool concept. And I, and I believe the original story has both of those. And it has the slavers and everything. Basically, I've seen drawings of what other people have imagined the slavers to look like. Their real name that we don't hear in this story. And they're not knockoff Chewbacca's. No. Even though I know this was pre Chewbacca. No, no, that's the Kazinti. This is. Yeah. Oh, these aren't this. Oh, oh, right. The, you're right. The, yeah, the yeah, slavers, yeah. the people the who created this. The original slavers stasis created it. Correct. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're totally right. It sort of looked like a platypus Godzilla with one eye or something. <laughs> like <laughs> the drawing is a little. Like I, I kind of think of it as the. And it, animated series in general i sort of think is sort of like the disney version of starfleet history you know it's yeah. just sort of like yes it's true for the most part but there's some embellishments and cutie sure. cute, yeah so it's well well listen if if the show enterprise was taking place as a prism through the holodeck with Riker, then then animated series absolutely would be a retelling of early adventures to the children of the next generation there you go yeah exactly right? um so their version of what the slave work looked like kind right. of looked like that. But yeah. it is, I think they mostly have been sort of like this one-eyed kind of brute well, I, force character. I dig this show. Not to jump around. I dig this I dig this episode a lot. But also, I, I absolutely, you could see the influence that it wasn't originally a Star Trek show. Because first of all and foremost, there's no Enterprise. And there's no Kirk. There's no Kirk. Yeah. There's no Bones. Like, it's... it These... There, these three could be ciphers. They could be any three explorers, you know, yep. fill in the blanks with whatever, uh, you know, whatever franchise you want to insert here. This could be Hawkeye, Captain America, and the Black Widow, you know? Well, yeah, they basically said this is sort of, it wasn't Larry Niven trying to adapt uh, the slaver weapon for the Star Trek universe. It was basically trying to take Kirk, Spock, and Uhura and put them into the known universe, which is what the, the their universe was called for that mm -hmm. story. Um, well, do you know why they didn't use Kirk in, and they used um, uh, Sulu instead? I don't. Um, I'm assuming that they were closer analogs to the original characters, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know. I, but oddly enough, if you if you look every once in a while, uh, they actually do use Kirk's face instead of Sulu, and they just put his hair on Kirk. <laughs> it's well, just weird. Well <laughs> Well, they could have done that in real life. Shatner could have just given his hair <laughs> over over to Takai. There you go. And uh, you know, hey, hey, play me. <laughs> well, it's 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 interesting. I heard this when we interviewed uh, Bob Klein, and I don't remember if that. Actually... Oh, you know, yeah. There's actually I'm uh, I've I'm seeing exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I've got a playing just so you know. Yeah, I've got a playing in the corner. So as we talk, and as we, I'm just refreshing. I've watched it like three times, but I, I I'm trying to keep up with you. But I absolutely just saw a drawing that you're talking about. It, yeah. it is 100 percent Kirk, but yep. it's it's not. It's Sulu. Yeah, it, it was interesting when we interviewed Bob, and like I said, I don't know if this this got on the air. Is that he was saying one of the challenges that they had for drawing um, Kirk is that he was basically generically handsome. So mm -hmm. it was like you're drawing a guy. Just yeah. a guy. And it was like, does it look like him? Maybe. Could it look like anybody? Yeah. And that was, th we thought was funny, sort of when they did the um, Green Lantern Star Trek crossover in the IDW uh, mm -hmm. Kelvin universe, is that Chris Pine is sort of that generic, handsome guy, but so sure. is Hal Jordan. So it's like, the, oh, yeah. The, it would have been really funny to see Hal Jordan and him look almost identical you know <laughs> it's, <just in> that <laughs> sort of... uh, well, it's, it's funny you say that generic that he said that about kirk about yeah. um uh shatner. shatner be obviously because shatner's face is the generic scary boogeyman from halloween exactly yes <laughs> so that's a perfect observation yeah. yeah shatner is the everyman who will haunt you at night and I've heard that IDW has similar issues trying to draw Chris Pine, the artist. Really? So, yeah, yeah, I could, so. I could, I could totally see that. Yeah. And I did my own like filmation version of the Green Lantern uh, crossover, just as a as a fun exercise. And nice. it did take quite some time to like, okay, that does look like Chris Pine. Zachary yeah. Quinto took like two minutes. It was just like, okay, that's him. You know, well, he like, looks. I mean, he 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 does have a similarity to uh, Leonard Nimoy. Yes, but he so, does have his own specific look too. Which absolutely. Is like, so, 
But uh, yeah, so that was really interesting. So that was the only episode of the original series uh, or the animated series that there was no Captain Kirk. And the next television show that would actually air also wouldn't have Captain Kirk because it would be Next Generation. So, wait, was this the last episode of the series? No, no, no. I'm just saying I'm this confused. is this did not have of the original series and the animated series. This is the only one that did not have Kirk. Right, right, right. And then the next time that you would see a, a series without Kirk would be the next series would have no Kirk. Period. Because right, it's, right, because right, it's right. the next generation. Got it. Um, but uh, voice wise, basically, we the listing has you know basically you've got uh, Leonard Nimoy, George Takei, and Nichelle Nichols and Majel Barrett doing all these voices, which they normally do. Mm-hmm. But there is one Kazin uh, in there. I think he was the the pilot or something like that. That does sound like Lou Scheimer. And I don't know if he did like two minutes of a voice and then they let James Dewan go back and doing it. But I'm 90% positive it's Lou Scheimer because I listened to that and then I listened to the um, narration, opening narration of Arc 2, which is another film sh- filmation show that Lou Scheimer did the voice for in the opening narration. We have finished testing the meat that was in the stasis box. It is protoplasmic and poisonous. For millions of years, Earth was fertile and rich. Then pollution and waste began to take their toll. Normally, we don't have a whole lot of variety in the voices. And I just thought it was interesting that I think there was at least one new, per- one different person in here than the average. I mean, he's popped in here and there. but And that's funny on a show, on an episode that has so few characters. We actually yes. get a little variety. Yeah. You know, it's almost a locked room episode. You know, like. Yeah our budget's low and we need to lock the main characters in a room and have yep. a recap about this season. Man, you remember that time we got bottle all those hijinks? Yeah, a bottle episode, right, right. Yeah. Uh yeah. It's uh, it's it's dynamite though. The the box, the um the mystery box. Yes. That I would not be surprised if the guys you ever see the movie um uh primer or primer? Yes. Yes. And that's the same concept here, sort of. A little little different. But mm-hmm. that once you go in that box, you've frozen time. And then you can go as long as you're in the box. You can leave. You know, when you leave, you've you've traveled that far back in time or whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's similar to this. Yeah, I, and I think it was. It's kind of interesting that I almost feel like the the same field is at work in the time trap, which was the episode where you go into this area of space and basically everything's in a stasis, and you leave it and you go back to. Mm-hmm. And so it's just sort of like no time passes when you're in in there sort of like it'd be interesting to find out if that was actually like left over from this slaver you yeah. know like it was like a maybe some sort of weapon that like blew up and it would freeze it or something i don't know is it i liked spock's description that like in it could be a grenade with its pin pulled yes. waiting to be exposed <laughs> like that's so dark <laughs> and apparently it was that's why they're that's why they have um the rule that you have to bring it to starfleet and they have to open it safely or whatever yeah 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 so yeah, the also um, and and the gun, the gun, the the main weapon. What do we do? That was in the box, called? right? The uh, yeah, the actual thing that was the. Did um, it have a name? I don't know. I don't think. I think it was just this weapon that they found. It was the the slaver weapon, which yeah, was sla- the, yeah, title, the, the title. The title drop. Right, it's the title, the slaver <laughs> weapon. But the actual, yeah. So the weapon itself looks like a looks like a watermelon. Yeah, which is interesting <laughs> because the first, the very first episode. The ship that they end up eventually, uh, Bob uh, Klein, who did eighty five to uh, sure, and and your <laughs> your interview by the way, your interview with Bob was awesome. The, Thank both you. those the, the two part episode was great. He was such a great uh, great guest, very giving, yeah, tons of detail, and you could tell that he really enjoyed his time working on the show because it was all like yesterday for him. It was great. Yeah, and uh, he recently did an episode of Trek Yards, which is not on Trek FM, but you should check it out, where they do only stuff about ships. And so mm. they had him on and they had him talk about the some of the stuff that he had designed because they had just finished their animated series uh, month. They were doing ships. And I said, oh, you got to get Bob Klein. Sure. And, uh, so they brought him in and he kind of, you know, it's interesting because some of those ships, like he talked about the Bonaventure, um, they were like, I did them and they were rejected. So I moved on. So there's not like I put in all of this thought and here's what I was thinking about the dimensions would be. And this, you know, it's like, so it's kind of interesting that people have, I think invented more stuff about 
about some of those ships afterwards. Like we were going for cool, and then, right, <laughs> but you know. no cool. But but what I really yeah. loved is he said cool, but you can't get cooler than the Enterprise. So if you yeah. did come up with something that looked a little cooler, you had to scrap it. Yep. Yeah. So that was pretty it's kind, cool. It's kind of fixing the game. <laughs> say the word cool again? No. <laughs> uh, so when he designed the the Bonaventure and that eventually turned into, they called it the watermelon ship at the end because they're the watermelon vines. It's okay. like I'm wondering if that was sort of, I'm assuming that he probably designed this weapon as well. So it might have been part of that, part of just his, his design style want, for that. I want to believe that literally they were they, they planned this out like over lunch one August afternoon and someone brought in a nice juicy watermelon and they were like, let's go for it, man. Let's go for it. It kind of has a, uh, almost a feeling of a super soaker too from the 90s. And oh, like. totally super soaker. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Like I thought it would be cool like if they had that in the 70s, it could have been like, you know, those lawn sprinkler things where you put the hose on it and they basically hovered? Yes, yes. It could be Which like now the- they do for real. You've seen that, right? The for real water jet packs? Oh so yes. there's a, yeah, yeah. There's a yeah, a backpack that you that it you leave a hose like a you know hundred foot hose in the water and right. it shoots you up in the air. Yes. Like you're Iron Man. Or like you're the Rocketeer. I don't think you could probably put that in your backyard with that hose. That probably would no. not have the no, same no, pressure. No, no, no. You need a lake. You need a lake. But yeah. uh, it's fantastic. And that's the same principle yeah. as those sprinklers from the seventies. Yeah. So I think that uh, you know that we could have had a slaver weapon toy. I mean, that would have been great. Why not? With all the different settings that could do all these crazy, wacky, wild, uh, sure, water thing. Honey, are you playing slaver weapon again? <laughs> yeah, sorry, mom. <laughs> the I think it, sorry, mom. I'm lighting off nuclear explosions on the next block. <laughs> And let's see. There's the, the telescope. Actually, okay. So the I think there were six settings. Maybe it looked like there were seven on the the dial or the the slider. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, there was the telescope. There was a laser that seemed like it was on par with maybe the Enterprise era weapons because mm-hmm. they said it wasn't as good as the ones that they had now. So I'm guessing they said I think they had we've had better technology for like a hundred years. And if yes, you go back a hundred years. That's that. Enterprise. So. Uh, a oh, personal funny. rocket. So there's your rocketeer, right. or your your backpack jet thing. Um, the energy absorber, uh, which did not somehow absorb the energy for their life belts, which is interesting. They uh, yeah. they did not die in the That's vacuum true. of space, <laughs> even though everything else uh, energy wise kind of went out of them. And it could, I mean, people are biochemical. That could have been energy. Maybe, too. Uh, maybe it. Uh, dilithium crystals are immune to it and their belts run on dilithium crystals that's the only power that's the only energy source that i know about there you go star trek yeah that could be um there's the other setting that turns on the kind of the ai to the weapon or whatever um and then when the captain asks for the high energy beam they get the that sulu had used earlier when they they um i guess that was the fifth one where they like blew up the part of the mountain or the yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. They, they it was a nuclear like it was it was big. okay total matter conversion that's what it was oh right right, right. yeah um i think then it in that last setting then basically turned on this the self-destruct yeah so um it was <laughs> the line that i thought was really interesting because it wasn't said properly i had to go look at the script it's supposed to say twist me witter shins mean uh, a direction contrary to the sun's course, considered as unlucky, counterclockwise. So instead of saying "twist this, twist me counterclockwise," they said "twist me Wittershins." So they use the word Wittershins. Wittershins. That's yeah. a word. Yes. That's that a apparently real world. A, a child in 1973 should have known. Apparently. Um, wow. That is. I missed that, and I don't ever want to hear the word. It's a terrible word. It's a terrible word. But Majel Come Barrett, on. who was doing the voice of the slaver weapon, did not say twist me Wittershins, meaning twist me counterclockwise. She said twist my Wittershins. Did she Which really? makes it, yes, it's like, That's twist, now, yeah. twist my Wittershins. <laughs> it's not like some sort of <laughs> new phrase. It's like, you know, until you reach the null position. <laughs> well, twist my Wittershins and call me Sally. Yeah, I never believed I'd live for a day to see this. I somehow imagine that is something that Scotty would say. Yeah, right. Yeah, with the me maybe even that twist me Wittershins. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really funny. So I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, so that was the, the weapon was pretty cool. Uh, they also found fresh meat in the box. Mm-hmm. 
which was I'm like that would be a great way to like deliver Amazon Fresh. <laughs> you just put it in oh, there. Oh my god! You could actually cook the meal. Yeah. So so your favorite restaurants could literally cook the meal, put it in one of these boxes, and it, in, there's no like what's worse than ordering home delivery from Mexican food? That's exactly. the worst food. Mexican food does not hold heat well. No. If you had one of these crazy boxes, oh my god, my I, every night would be takeout and delivery every night. Hundred percent. That would be great. Stasis yeah. Pizza. <laughs> well, well, pizza holds pretty well. I yeah, think this true. would this would be the enemy of pizza. I don't yeah. mean to no budget, oh, okay. but this would be this would put a dent in the pizza delivery service because pizza is so hot. It takes a few minutes to cool down so you can get to it. If they put it in the stasis box, you would they'd start getting like hot coffee lawsuits and stuff. <laughs> Maybe I I like the idea of the the Mexican Barbe- food barbecue 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 would, is also really bad when you get it delivered. You gotta get it fresh. There's something else that we ordered recently. We're like, Ugh, this is oh, anything that has if they do fries or anything that's like supposed oh, to be yeah. crispy, and then like the steam that you put it into yeah. the container is just sort of like it makes everything mushy. So do you don't ever order a hamburger delivered. That's it. That's another one. Don't yeah. ever do it. No, nope. no, unless they say I have a stasis box. <laughs> like okay, yeah, I'd like to order a hamburger hamburger for delivery. Do you have a stasis box? No, we're all out right now. Cancel my order. We had one, but we don't have the other one, so we can't find it. <laughs> yeah. That was, was kind of cool. You had to have a, a, a stasis box to find another one. It's sort of like a right. uh, a pairing thing or, you know, it's like a, a find my phone. But you have to Yeah, have. totally. Uh, but the, it, I think they asked the question. It was Uhura who asked. It's like, well, how did they find the first one? It's like, mm-hmm. well, like most things, like, or like a lot of uh, – what is it? Historical presidents or something like that. It's like yeah. it was an accident, basically. It's, yeah, it's lost. Yeah, lost to time. Or yeah, stumbled across it. Um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. Uh, story wise, what what did you think of the story? Oh, I thought it was cool. You know, I, I like that it's a change of pace. Um, I do think that just based on the the way the show the the characters are pretty interchangeable. You know, which is mm-hmm. a which is a demerit in my book. You know, it didn't one. It could have been any three of the of the. Uh, could have been any members of the of the ship on there yeah. but also didn't have to be star trek people on there no. you know this, this is an adventure that could have been had by any scooby gang fill in the blank right you kind of had to have a woman though just given the <laughs> sure yeah sure you do <laughs> no they, they I'm just they... kidding <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, there was an interesting. It's like they said that modern Kazinti females. This was, and then oh, this is right, right. This right, is right, actually right. in the equivalent of Memory Alpha for the known universe. And they said that modern Kazinti females are not sentient, and they've been bred that way for many centuries. But in ancient times, they were sentient. I'm like, okay, that's weird. And then later, I was reading that the slaver people, or the slaver race, the Thrint, uh, their females were non sentient. So I'm like, what is? Uh, they're just breeders like yeah what's the I, point of, yeah, I mean what's the point of having them it must just they kept them around to breed my right question is and, like what is, is larry niven have against women well <laughs> sure that's just sort of you odd know. it's like okay one i could see that being interesting it's like okay that's that's a weird odd thing that you could put into a science fiction book but, but two races in the same universe is kind of huh. okay um <laughs> but i think you kind of needed to have uhura or chapel or yeah sure, someone like that that yeah, because yeah. The, I, I like that idea that's like hey they don't think that i'm a threat and i, I love her reaction she's like thanks thanks a lot you know she's yeah like, <laughs> she's great oh yeah. uhura is great in this yeah. episode yeah and when when uh sassy. there's yes yeah, totally sassy there's a moment where uhura's running away and one of the kids in are like like no, you fool! She can think for herself, yeah. or something like that. Which is interesting because he knew so that all crazy. along. Yeah. That was weird. It's like, no, okay, it's are you just letting her get away with things? Yeah. Or <laughs> maybe he was keeping that to himself. Like that was right. his card. That it's like, oh, well, yeah. I know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than Dopey over here because I know you have a brain. Yeah. And it was interesting because they, you know, she's supposed to be this. She was talking about how she ran the hundred meter. Or well, she said the hundred. She didn't say what the what yeah. the measurement was. You know, in record time at one point, she was sort of running in that like Scooby Doo. Oh of, yeah, totally. Well, you know, it's like it was a very uh, well. I mean, they have these pre-programmed sort of you know almost like computer macros. They have these sets of of motions that they use yeah. and replicate. But it was sort of like mm, 
She she should have been running slightly differently, but they're not going to reanimate it just for no, that. No, 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 especially, especially in heels. She was sort though. of like, yeah, she's like in heels, like. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I like that uh, that they were on this sort of planetoid that it was, you know, almost what is a class J planet or whatever they they call the ones that are um, in Star Trek, where it's almost um, inhabitable. It's, it's almost a yeah. meteor, like a meteor. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so my uh, my question, the Kazinti, have they shown up in anything else, or did they use them in any other books? Or uh, they've used them in a comic book, uh, not a comic book, the uh, weekly comic strip that oh, appeared cool. in the eighties. Yeah, um, I think it was sort of like in the motion picture looking style. It may have been when they switched over to like the Wrath of Khan design. I don't remember exactly. I have to go back and look, but. They were planning on bringing them uh, into season five of the of Enterprise. Shut up. Yeah, so we would have actually had this last Kazinti war. Oh wow! Though I don't know how we would have had ones before it. Um, it would have, you know, the timeline has to be changed. They're just sometimes people say things that aren't quite right. Yeah. And also, it's the animated series, and people sort of cherry pick what they want to use as canon and what's not. So right. Who knows? Maybe Sulu just didn't know his history. Right? I just want to see know? a bunch of dog face people running around. Um, they also with the, with the cat people. <laughs> well, well, wait. So are because wait are because see cat people or dog people? They're cat. They're those are cats. Cats like yeah, with rat tails in the. If you look at the original description, so that, that's why they call them cat rats. <laughs> okay, I must sound like an idiot. I swear to God, I thought this whole time they were more doggy than cat. Nope. I get they look like dogs to me. Really. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a dog person. They're kind of so. wolf-like, maybe. Wolf-like. Yeah, I mean, I guess they got the yeah. cat jowls, but, got, but I, yeah, I feel like their the, mouth is kind of dog. But no. they have the, the cat whiskers. Yeah, oh, you're whiskers. right. Yeah, you're right. No, no, you know what it is? When they go to a side view, they look yes. like dogs. That's yeah. You're totally right. Well, from a front view, yes, you look at it, you're like, you're a cat. But from the side, they look like dogs. Um. Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting because we were... I. You go through and you find articles that other people have written about the animated series that, you know, people who aren't really paying attention or don't really, you know, know much about it. It's like they'll say something like Emress, who's the cat woman. She purrs when she talks. This dog like creature, blah, blah, blah. And people oh, are yeah, like, yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, and that one even you would know as a cat. Yeah. Well, she's well, she's she's on the ship a lot. Is she right? Yes. She's yeah. she has white fur. She uh, no, it's or, it's sort of a um, reddish fur. OK. I think uh, I, I think I know who you're talking about, though. She basically takes over for Uhura when she's not on duty. Oh she's yes, like the, yeah, 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 the, yes, yes. I well, do she's know who you're talking sort about. Sort of brown and well, right. I mean, well now that now that they're not dogs, I thought they were dogs. I was gonna make a joke about Nort, the uh, the dog Green Lantern that they could totally have a meet up with in the Green Lantern crossovers. <laughs> well, and you were saying that actually Larry Niven wrote a Green Lantern. Story. He did. That's I've never read Ringworld. I've heard of it. Um, I've never had Ringworm. Heard of it too. That's good. Uh, and I've and but uh, my first uh, my first introduction to Larry Niven of who he was was uh, he did a uh, 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 paper not a not a it wasn't a trade it was a, it was a deluxe format he did a deluxe mm -hmm. the first I ever heard of Larry Niven was he did a deluxe format a Green Lantern story with John Byrne probably circa 1995 maybe 96 okay. and it was called Gambit's Tale. And it was one of the first times that DC ever actually gave um, personality to one of the uh, uh, elders of the universe, the little blue Owens that, that oh, hang right, out with it. Right. Yeah. For years, they were really just all the same kind of dudes that all hung out together. And then <laughs> this story, which Larry wrote, really gave one of them a name, Ganthet, and really established, oh, yeah, no, they can be individuals. Uh, and the coolest thing that came and John Byrne, I love his artwork. It's always fantastic. Uh, one of the cool things they did in the story that I'm sh was, I imagine, was one of Larry's things is they used, um, and you, as an artist, you probably appreciate this. They used um, like color shifting. So there was a there. Uh, Green Lantern had to stop something that was yellow, and his ring doesn't work on yellow. Right. So he surmised that if he flew fast enough away from the object that he had to stop, the color shift from the speed would change oh. the color of his ring and thus allow him to affect the yellow object that he had to take care of. Mike Johnson needs to listen to this because that would be a really good thing for like the next Star Trek Green Lantern crossover. Oh, yeah. Especially because they can go at those speeds. It's, oh, yeah, totally. It was cool. It was a really mm. cool concept. I remember that was like kind of the climax of the book. That was how, cool. that was how Hal uh, had to figure it out. But it's a fun story. Nice. It, de it dealt with uh, – 
the origin of the universe and like Cro- Chrono, Crona, and um, you know, like the hand that holds the the DC universe together. That whole thing, and okay. um, yeah, it's cool. It's called Gamphis. Take a look at it. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. They've reprinted it a couple times, like in various like best of Green Lantern collection stuff. But that's Larry Niven. Nice. I feel like I might actually have that electronically. One of the things when I was watching this that sort of struck me because I've I've looked at all the different versions of these this story. I I mean I don't I didn't read the first one or the original, but I do know about it. Um, this this stasis box was found by someplace else by someone else. In the Alan Dean Foster version, they actually found it on another planet and it was like a starfleet archaeological team okay in the first draft of this story they find the stasis box floating around in a destroyed kazinti ship from the kazin man war so that would be like salvage right but in this version they say they found it on kazinti hmm. so the question is that you know they talked about what was it the treaty of sirius where they're not allowed to have weapons, they can basically have police vehicles, which to me kind of sounds like Japan after World War II. They basically uh, sort yeah. of have have a military. It's just not called that. It's more of a defense force, and because they have jets and right, 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 tanks and all that stuff. Um, and this the ship that they were in, the Trader's Claw, was a stolen police vehicle. They said, okay. So I'm wondering, maybe part of that treaty is that they're not allowed to have these stasis boxes or well, yeah, because I, I got, well, the I, got the, I mean, I got the feeling that the stasis boxes are so, so rare that most likely no, the, whoever would have them would want to keep it pretty secret. You know what I mean? Right. So even if even if, whether or not the Gazinti were allowed to actually have it or not, I don't think they're, they're spreading the good news that, you know, hey, look, no. we got a stasis box and inside is a piece of unrotting meat. But wasn't this what? But didn't Starfleet find it though? They said Starfleet. Well, Starfleet, found, Starfleet, Starfleet, yeah, Starfleet found theirs. But wasn't? But there was a second one, right? It was discovered by archaeologists on the planet Kazin. But okay. then, as they're as they're traveling, it goes ping ping, and they go to another planet, whatever planet. Right, this they find the other one. On. Right, yeah, they find the other one, and the other one. It's which do you, is it? The other one that has the weapon in it? Yes. Which I one? think so. Or no, they had an empty one. Remember, they had an empty box that lured them there. Yeah, unfortunately for them, Kazinti lie nearby in ambush with an empty stasis box. So they used the empty stasis box to lure Starfleet there. Starfleet had the box that they found on Kazinti that was filled with the picture and the... the so the Kazinti used their empty box. So they got a box and they found one randomly and they opened yeah. it and it was empty. Right. But they used it knowing that whoever had the other box would come looking for it. And then yeah. they would they were gonna plunder whatever was in so the box that we're that we're seeing all the stuff come out of is the Starfleet box that we have started the show with. Yes. But that Starfleet box came from Kazinti. They said they found an right. archeolo- you know. So either they as archaeologists found them or Kazinti archaeologists found them. Either way, why does Starfleet get them? The Kazin are not part of Did, did Star Trek does, conquer Starfleet. Kazin or something? Well, uh, there's the that treaty, but a treaty shouldn't like be like, and now we get everything that you ever find. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so. Oh, it's not. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. That's. I thought that's how it went. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it, I would hope that Starfleet would be a little bit more enlightened than you know Imperial Britain or something like that. <laughs> but, um, or modern day United States. Or us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I, you know, the. It, if they're so rare, I doubt that that would be like, oh, let's make sure that we put this into the treaty to make sure that everybody, yeah, you know that that seems unlikely. Um, and if it's not, and they did put it in there, it's like, I, I wonder why the Kazin would actually have agreed to that. Maybe because they're so rare, they didn't think they'd ever. The fact that they found one on their planet was interesting. So, um, yeah. So I just I thought that that was. I feel like you. Any, uh, I feel like a good writer could no prize themselves out of this, and just say that it was a joint Starfleet slash Kazinti uh, eco, uh, uh, archaeological dig on Kazint, and, uh, and they found it. This, yeah, and yeah. they just and they just said, "All right, we're paying for this find, so anything we find, we're going to keep." Or, well, yeah, paying for it in the world with no money, um, right? <laughs> well, that's it's kind of interesting because up until the end of the animated series, they talk about cost and money and penny for your thoughts and things like that and then it was next generation that where said no money they had no money yeah. so here's a question about the no money thing 
is it only the Federation planets? But like, do Klingons have money? Do and you know, I'm talking like free Ferengi before before they do. were cool. Who? Yeah, the Ferengi are they're way into money, yeah. right? Yeah. So the Frankie so, were supposed to be an analog for us in the 20th century. Okay. So, <laughs> so how does so how does that jive with? There's no money. There's no need. Is it only if you're a member of the Federation? Yeah, I think you, as a member of the Federation, you have certain inalienable, not rights, but like you you have a right to food, housing, etc. So there's it's it's sort of they called it what is it post scarcity economy. Okay. Where you know, you don't have to worry about having food or shelter because that's all taken care of. So you don't worry about making money but, or whatever. But there still has to be a way to right. exchange exact, goods and services. That's exactly what I was just going to ask. So when they when they encounter another culture, like we'll just exactly. use the Ferengi as, as an example. And yeah. they're like, hey, we're friendly. Everything's cool. But we have all this rice we want to trade. I imagine it must be you know, something how does that like work? what... Janeway did in the Delta Quadrant. You know, they were like, "Oh, we'll what give is- you fifteen liters of, you know, warp plasma for these electronic parts to fix our broken computer or whatever." So it's just a, a whole barter system. It must be a barter system. Although they did have one, it was like a next generation. This is obviously not thought out very well. By no, it's not because the then how, because then <laughs> wait like, a minute because I watched all yeah. the next gens and then there were people who who were humans and I'm assuming part of the Federation. They were like considered rich. Like yeah, wasn't well. Wasn't, there was Carter Winston Troy's... in the animated series where he was like this big philanthropist. That, yeah, wasn't uh, Deanna Troy's mom who was played by Majel Barrett, right? Wasn't she? Wasn't she really rich? Uh, I guess. I mean, she was royalty. Royalty. I guess different okay, than being rich. I guess she that's was different. A yeah, but there were rich the Chalice of Reeks. But there were sacred. there were rich people though on the show, right? So how does that? I don't understand yeah. how that works. I mean, not I, not members, not members of the crew. But they would encounter people that I'm presuming were on Federation territory that were like, yeah, oh, but they were never man. considered rich. Like we, there was even a conversation on a recent mission log where they were talking about this episode where this woman was developing a new mining technology, and it was very important that this, you know, that you know, use my technology and blah blah blah. And they were like, why is it so important to you? Is it prestige? Because it's supposedly not money. It's not like if you use this mining technology, then I will get you know, extra right. credits or right. whatever. And, you know, and they did talk about using credits at one point, you yeah. know, it was like deducting, like, I think it was, it might even been counter at our point where, Oh, just charge this, the silk to my room with these credits. Or it was like somehow that had to been paid for sure with some sort of energy. You know, maybe there's a giant Starfleet currency exchange machine somewhere that we don't know about. Um, I think this is just ample evidence that, uh, capitalism is the only true economy and uh the socialism does not work and uh living in fantasy land okay that's uh yeah i just just wanted to, i don't know i don't know where that came from <laughs> we'll edit that out no. <laughs> i was just making a joke uh yeah no so I, but yeah. it's funny these are the things these are the questions though that you uh that you really need to think out you know yeah. when you're when you're when you're building worlds like this well, it, it's kind of interesting because people, you know, make fun of the animated series and stuff. How many episodes of like Scooby Doo is going to generate some sort of like discussion about socialism and post scarcity economy? Oh. And it's like, <laughs> oh, you mean mean other than all of them? None of yeah. them. None of or, them. Or or use they're, the they're, word they're, Wittershins. <laughs> yeah, they're going to generate discussions on the safety of amusement park rides, oh, funhouse yeah. mirrors, and latex masks, and um, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, Latex allergies. That's what that's what uh, Scooby Doo is going to generate. That was actually when I saw the picture of the slaver that they pulled out. I'm like, that looks like yeah. a Scooby Doo villain. You know what he looked like? Mm. There was a toy. There was a toy from the early '80s that I you probably knew because I know a lot of people did. I had it all the way up till we moved out here, and I I, I either sold it or I gave it to somebody. Called Monsters and Mayhem. Or monsters and might, and it was a draw. No, it was a dr- well. It was a, it was a drawing tablet. So you had three different. There were plates on it, and they were like stencil plates. Okay. And there was a top for a head. There was a torso with arms, and then there was a, a leg section with the bottom of the arms, and they all matched up, but they were all very different. So you could do a head of a vampire with the body of a 
of a uh, like a space alien and the legs of a wolf man and you know all the actual all the actual borders of it would match and you would lay your piece of paper over it and take the little black chalk and rub over it and you would do a rubbing of it and they also there were plates to do like alien backdrops on it so you would basically okay. create your own create your own picture that you would then take off and you would color in with colored pencil to make your own picture but you were creating these monsters i'm sure people out there know what i'm talking about uh, I'll try to before you put the show up. I'll try to find it. Yeah, and, we'll, and send we'll you over the put link. in the, the yeah. commercial. But it was great because it was super. Like it was just it was super creative and super fun, and you made all kinds of different monsters. And uh, that's what this monster looked like. It looked like a, a guy that you made from this playset thing. We've all been staying up nights playing with this mighty man and monster maker kid. With this kid, your children can combine different chests, legs, and heads. Yes. <laughs> they can color in scales, hair, or alligator skin. Very nice. They can make hundreds of monsters and heroes. Personally, I prefer the monsters. <laughs> That's it. Okay. The Mighty Men and Monster Maker. That's totally it. Yep. So I... I told you it was something like Might and Monster or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Monsters and Mayhem, I believe, actually is. That feels like it's a toy that may have existed. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I wasn't that far off. No. It also reminds me, I feel like there was some sort of, in the 70s, a green stretchy, like like Stretch Armstrong, but with like a stretch well, the, alien. Well, they did a Hulk. Like there, there was, well, there was a Hulk. Oh, was it well, Hulk no, no. Yeah, there, there was a Hulk. There was a stretchy Hulk. But I didn't Stretch Armstrong have an enemy that he fought? Yeah, but I don't know if it was just a person. Oh, was it? Okay. I, I actually never had Stretch Armstrong. I wonder how those things But they did fared. they did do a Hulk. They absolutely did a Hulk version of Stretch, like that style right. of Stretch Armstrong. I wonder how those things have fared over time. Like, what has happened to the uh, the plastic? Oh, I don't think well. I think they corroded pretty, pretty, pretty good. I found it. It's called Stretch Monster. And except for having two eyes instead of one, it looks very similar. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So apparently, I have a good memory for a toy that I don't even think I, we even knew anybody who had. It must have been from the commercial. Oh, you know what? I had a friend who had this. I seem to remember like I absolutely had a friend have, who yeah, had this guy. It, I, I can. I yes. I have a weird tactile memory of like the weird scale, the plastic, and then as you stretched it, the scales kind of like stretched at the same time. That yeah, is weird. yeah, because he looked. I remember he looked like the Kraken from Clash of the Titans. Yes, that's why I remember. I used to like. I when I'd go over there, I'd be like, "I'm gonna play with the Kraken." This was from Kenner. Huh. Cool. Well, that's cool. It's Kenner's new Stretch Monster. Look out, Stretch Armstrong! <laughs> this will stop Stretch Monster. No, it won't. He's freeing himself. It's Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk from the Elastic Superhero Collection. I can beat that. You can tie them in a tangle, then see how they unwrangle. You can stretch the legs and arms, it won't do any harm. Watch this. The Elastic Spider-Man and Hulk. Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk, each sold separately from the Elastic Superhero Collection by Mego. This has been Saturday Morning Toys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that it's actually what, one of the things I love about our show is that we can find these little side trips that really are like fun and jog your memory about things you may have totally just forgot about and they pop out. And Absolutely. Part of what I like about this show is it feels like it's also helping capture history and keeping those little pieces of, like in a stasis box for the future. For people yes, who it's like, yes. you know, no one's ever going to like... In the grand scheme of things, the animated series does not matter that much, even in Star Trek, unfortunately, um, except for the people who really like it. And then it, you know, then you realize as you start to it's like, actually, it is really important because there are all these different things. So I'm I'm happy that we're able to to have conversations with people who work on the show and and, you know, give it the respect it deserves as opposed to like, oh, it's just that filmation show with the crappy animation. You know, just like I don't know how many times I've heard that, so it's it's frustrating. Oh no, it's yeah, it is totally frustrating because a lot of a lot of people put a lot of work into it, yeah. and and it shows. If you really watch the show, it's pretty good. And the speed at which they worked, I mean, that's to me just yeah. Like I'm not going to be able to do that even with a computer. So, right? Yeah, crazy. So, is there anything more in the story? I know we were talking about Uhura. We talked about 
um, Spock and sort of, oh, one thing that was kind of interesting was the whole idea that if you thought of eating vegetables and then they're, they're kind of <laughs> yes. telepath is like, oh my God, that just makes me sick. I cannot. And they have to recover after each time he read their mind when they're picturing yeah, chewing a that's... salad or something. I, I identified with them so much at that moment. I'm like, yes, yes. Vegetarianism. Yeah. Give me some meat. Give me, give me some of that stasis held 2000 year old fresh meat. Well, or or they were they were excited because they might be able to eat Uhura, Spock, and Sulu if they uh, right if they won. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's even better. Although maybe not um, Spock, I think... they might not want him to eat eat him because he uh, he had eaten the vegetables. Oh, that's true. That is true. Yeah, because he was vegetarian, right? Yes. Isn't that canonically he is? Yeah, Vulcans uh, being vegetarians were established in all our yesterdays. So that was the episode where he met Marion Hartley. When they went through the portal that threw them into that planet's past, they were sending all of their people into the past because their planet was going to be destroyed. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was a season three episode um, of the original series. But, uh, yeah, so that was... Marriott, Hart- Marriott Hartley, later of TV's family? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Just want to drop, drop some random IMDb. Uh, she was also in uh, Gene Roddenberry's... Um, like is it the, is it the, the one that, is it the one where they did the 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 baked in pilot? Yes, it was the it was the pilot. It was supposed to be for you know the guy who's frozen, Dylan Hunt, which is interesting because they reused that name later for uh, um, Andromeda, uh, and he wakes up in this future after there's been a cataclysm, and and she's there. Yeah. She was also in a pilot for a TV show that didn't take off called Earth Two, which is very similar to that the the same name. Well, they. They did do a show called Earth 2. Yeah, they yeah. did do a show called Earth 2, but this is not the one from the 90s. This is Earth 2. Got it. It was very much like 2001. It was sort of a international space station that became its own country. They voted, um, and they were allowed to base. They were allowed to be. <laughs> I, I know, it's all right. I hit my. I'm gesturing and I whacked my mic. <laughs> hey, that's okay. You got excited about Earth too. Yes. You got excited about the concept of people voting themselves out of the oppression of their dictators. Yes, I get it. Were... <laughs> I'm excited too. And she was a photographer, and she was up there with her husband, and they had their kid, and they captured a Chinese uh, missile that had a nuclear weapon in it that was against the treaty that they had. And she was so upset that they had this thing stored there because they're like, oh, good, now we have a missile and we can have defense, uh, that she decided she was just going to shoot it into the sun. So she goes oh. into the, the, you know, the cargo bay where it's held and pushes the button when she sees the sun. Not being smart That's at not all. how it works. No, because, you know, there's a lot of mechanics involved. And so it was going to basically not how it works. fall on Washington, D.C. or something like that. But that was the first episode. And it was. Oh, that's great. It was interesting. And it just didn't get picked up. But. It's funny, on one of my recent Joe and Joes, we talked about firing things into the sun and how incredibly difficult it actually is. Yeah. Like, uh, there was, I was reading an article about that where the, you can't, it's it's literally not like, hey, there. even if you have all the thruster power in the world, it's not point at the sun and go. Like, you have to, like, point away from the sun right. in order to counteract the, the orbit that you're actually in mm-hmm. without realizing it and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, it's not like Superman flying into the sun and no right, <laughs> and that's the example they were talking about. Superman four, <laughs> <laughs> Superman four, yeah, that's exactly it. Oh they were like, gosh. yeah, it kind of wouldn't work that way, but okay. Um, but it's funny. I always had, I always had when I was a kid. I was always like, uh, you know, eighties was big on garbage and yeah. recycling, and like there, we have all this garbage. And in my head, I was always like, why don't they just pack up the garbage on the space shuttle, tow it out into space, throw it in the sun? Well, because it would probably cost and I still, more money than I just... still want an answer why we can't do that. I don't care about money. Like we said, let's go post let's go post economy, man. Let's just do it. You, let's just take you all this how much stuff. thrust would be required to put all of the garbage or in. Or like garbage, plutonium, whatever we don't want. And I I get it. If the space shuttle explodes with plutonium on it, we're in trouble. Sure. Okay. So we lose Florida. I'm fine with that. We could launch all this stuff into the sun. This is just my childhood brain thinking that still has never left me. I'm always still like, eh, Superman 4 worked. Well, if we had a Superman, it probably would work because he could just, he would counteract the gravity. And Oh, man, if we had a Superman, stop it. Stop it. Or a Supergirl. Everything would be so much better. Or a Supergirl, that's fine. I don't yeah. care. Just any Kryptonian. Any Kryptonian works. Well, oh, my God, that'd be amazing. No, no, no. We don't want any Kryptonian. G- General Zod would be dope. <laughs> 
<laughs> he'd he'd certainly be a strong leader. <laughs> I was I I saw I saw the other day at the store there were uh there were Terrence Stamp General Zod action figures marked down discounted to three dollars and ninety cents. I almost bought like all six of them. Where was this? Just having. It's a, a Toys R Us. Oh, it's I thought you said an army the, of Zods. For some reason, I thought you said at the post office. I'm like, no, like, no, it's why a store. are there post office? Selling? Oh, that would be well because his name is because he's a stamp. Ah, Terrence. Stamp. Oh, that just happened. I think that, that maybe my brain happened. must have connected those two, and like <laughs> Toys R Us sounds kind of like post office, I guess. And like that just happened because he's a stamp. Yeah. Wow. You could tell your grandma that joke. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's go back on track a little bit. Um, so we had, we were talking about the, the, basically the vegetarianism and using, you know, like looking into their brain. Um, yeah, yeah. Which was kind of interesting. And the not wanting to read, I guess it's like, if you didn't think that the, the female was sentient, wouldn't you at least maybe give it a try just to like make sure? Or, I don't know. It just seems... That was kind of interesting. And since the other guy seemed to know that she was a smart person, why didn't he just say, just read her mind anyway? Well, you know, like, it's kind of like in Planet of the Apes, when they just assume that none of the humans can talk, they just dismiss them. You yeah, know, even, they... when, even, when, even when Taylor, like, does talk, oh, and it's obvious that he's not talking, yeah. he's obvious he's talking, they still are like, most of the apes are still like, yeah, whatever, he's just mimicking us. You know, like, there's that... There's that you want to dismiss it because yeah. you've never seen it before, you know. So I think that's what's at that's what's at play. I do want to say that their little police web is pretty sweet. Yeah, you know, it, it to me it seems like I know people are like, well, we never saw that again. It's like, well, we see force field essentially, like yeah, on you know in the brig or something like that. I kind of think it's something along those lines. Sure, yeah, it's a little little stasis, like a little mini jail cell that has no, yeah. you can't really see. If you're on it, you're stuck. If you're not, you're up. I kind of like that idea. I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, Although the, the the question there though is, uh, uh, kind of like how earlier you said when it saps the energy, yeah. why didn't it sap the energy from their belts? Like if if this little pad is exerting some kind of force on them, why are they not just like laying on the ground? You know what I mean? Like why yeah. is why are they able to stand upright if that's the kind of force? But I, I don't care. Maybe I, as listen, you get further towards the work. edge, it just gets more and more hard to lift your legs yeah. or something. And yeah, I, I don't know how warp nacelles work either, but I think they're pretty cool. So <laughs> I always thought it's like okay, if you're it, 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 we, who knows how the stasis field works, but if it, it like you said, it did kind of feel like it was holding them down. What if you jumped? If you just like jumped up, right? Because they, right, they right, could right, lift right. their legs. It looked like they were able to do that. At yeah. Least, so. yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, just basically fall out of the web. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and they, what got me was, okay, as far as like, it, it, you know, believability or, or you know, just the internal integrity of the, the universe. And their uh, she has a stasis belt. We've seen in ep other episodes before that the stasis belt is also a force field. They had the, mm -hmm. the bridge defense system, which we only saw once in the very first episode, basically was trying to fire on Kirk and could not penetrate the stasis belt. How did the Kazin, like, weapon get through the stasis belt and zap Uhura? She should have been like, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Bounced off me. Bye-bye. <laughs> Adios. Yeah. Adios, dopes. I don't know the answer to that. But I think we need to talk about the ending. Where the, yeah. the bad guys straight up die. Yeah, that is different by their than own hands. Like any, yeah, by their own hands. But still, for a a nineteen seventies filmation cartoon, it's a little bit of a grim ending. A little bit, Wait. a little bit would be appropriate. <laughs> well, yeah. A little bit, and also it, it is okay. It it's probably a reasonable ending for this story. But at the end, when they're inside of the shuttle, uh, Uhura's like, you know. The Kazin, you know, used to have a legend that their weapons were haunted by their dead owners. And she's like, ha, I guess at this rate, they'll never get over those superstitions. Like, that, no, no, no. <laughs> this isn't a ha, 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 freeze frame moment. That's, that is kind of insensitive of her. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Well, listen, first they stole their archaeological find. And you're, now they just, they're, uh, whatever, they blew eh, themselves up. Oh, Dopes. Well. Yeah. Uh, cat people, dog people, whatever. Whatever it is. Those people ate other people at some point in history. Why do we right? care? Right? They totally did. And wait a minute. They ate humans, it sounded they, like, at one point. Right? Right? Yeah. So it makes sense, though, that, 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 that cats would be just the, the monsters that are eating 
that that would never eat vegetarian because cats are monsters. I I'm love a dog my cat. person. My, cats my, are my cat monsters. loves avocado. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, no, cats love Is vegetables. It? Peas, D- spinach leaves, avocado. Really? Yep. Well, before we kind of wrap up the the, yeah, I was not gonna say that. Um. So basically, we it, we have a, a questionable uh, a procurement of the stasis box. We have all the Kazinti dying or Kazin <laughs> dying, and we have um, basically who are laughing at it. The, the end. <laughs> yeah. So She's, well, listen. Hey, if anyone's gonna laugh, it's gonna be the one who is dismissed as being brainless by this. That's He's true. Like, yeah. Uh huh. You're all gonna dismiss me. We're done. Yeah, We're done. I kind of never thought of that. That's an interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Well, I don't feel so bad about it now. But yeah, right. That's true. The and sexist, I mean, sexist die in it's a fire sexist, explosion. But it's interesting though. It's like when you think about it. If they, well, they bred the women to be basically. Yeah, non essential so that's it's, horrible so never mind it's almost it's even like worse it's, yeah. if, like, if it was a biological <laughs> thing that was just happened to be right. which is yeah, really just odd one day they woke yeah. up yeah, yeah um, they woke up one day and were like it's fembots no 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 right. they were like we're going to selectively breed the intelligence out of you yeah yeah yeah, about, yeah okay sure yeah I don't, I don't know what i just i can't what like what is that world that you go there and they're just if they're non-sentient what are they are, are they like cats well, like actually well, like, saying, they're it, rolling around and you know, they, training well, that's themselves. An, that's and... that's an interesting idea. That that might be the case. Um, but I, it sounds like they're just made for breeding. Yeah, and the dudes are just doing dude stuff, <laughs> which is really like you know, okay. Yeah, sure. I need bunch I, of guys sit, sitting around scratching themselves. Literally, <laughs> their cats just scratching themselves. I'm yeah. My cat does other things that you don't want to see them doing. In front of oh yeah, thing things we may not want to say on you know yeah. Uh, you know, I want to say on, on a family podcast. <laughs> I, I'll have to do a little bit more research and figure out what the sla- the uh, Kazin are actually like in the known universe. If they if they talk about that, now it's it's weird that this might be my my in to Larry Niven's work is just this one random animated Star Trek yeah. episode. Well, so. they so not to be not to be a you know a luddite or whatever, but have they ever done like a Ringworld cartoon or anything that would make it real easy for us to kind of understand what ring world's all about no i don't think so they may have done a illustrated version or a comic maybe i think that they do i want to say they started to to do a tv show but it didn't happen or something i don't know um uh oh and there was another time i forgot the uh the kazin were also on the elysian council in the time trap there was just one episode uh the one where they're stuck in the where we see the bonaventure the first ship with warp drive or modern warp drive as we've sort of retconned it um and they're stuck in there and they the klingons and them help and get out um the there was one on their council so there was a kazin that was was trapped in there and he became docile and normal um not normal did larry niven did larry niven write any of the uh live action shows uh no i don't believe so but it it seems like when they do i mean as far as animated series episodes go, this is interesting. It has a lot. It's a, it's really dense. There's a lot of well, there's a lot of monologue, which isn't necessarily always the best thing. Um, but it feels like when they use actual science fiction writers, they get a lot of good stuff out of Star Trek. So you know, you got great stories out of them. So I, it was smart of Dorothy to go, you know, try and solicit more stories from from those writers. Mm-hmm. Totally. So I think, and you know, we were talking about the ending of uh, this kind of being non, uh, kind of animated series like, uh, and then I was talking about the time trap that also had the Kazin in it. That ending was a little bit odd too because the the comic book that it was based off of basically the uh, Enterprise and the Klingons cooperate, get out of their trap. And basically, you're like, hey, maybe cooperating isn't so horrible, and you know, shake hands and take off. That would have been a great yeah. ending for the animated series. But the Klingons try to blow up the Enterprise, get out, claim that they were the ones who got everybody out, <laughs> and then took <laughs> off. So I'm like, hmm. <laughs> it's like it's it's like it also maybe not the uh, the best ending. 
you always count on the Klingons to just really just be a bunch of jerks. They're space jerks, even when they were even when they were with the Federation. Yes, they're space jerks. It does kind of fit Klingons better, and I don't really have a problem with that because it it did fit their character. It would make more sense if it was Romulan because I can kind of see them doing that, and they have done that in the past. Yeah, but uh, yeah, this this was a different ending. You know, we don't normally have children's shows killing off even bad guys. You know, even like in G.I. Joe that I always joked about when, uh, you know, Cobra gets shot down, parachutes, you know, come out of yeah. whatever. They, oh, yeah. And a river comes oh, out of nowhere and they land totally. in it. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> parachutes, parachutes left. And sometimes there's two parachutes like the, the, just to make sure that, yeah, this guy had two parachutes right. on him. See, he, See nobody got hurt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very much alive. I, I, I yeah. So it's absolutely it was. A, that's why it was such a big deal. Uh, for the Transformers movie when they killed mm-hmm. Optimus Prime. Like yeah. kids were like kids were like, What? Why what did you just do? I almost wonder if this would just this is just more acceptable in the seventies than it was in the eighties. Because in the eighties we started to slide into the Yeah. Everybody's precious and we need to make sure that they don't experience well, yeah, they, anything I mean, they, bad they, ever. And like okay. Well there were I mean there were definitely rules in the seventies, but yeah. it it was rules like you couldn't punch people. It was all about rep, drug re- use. replicable yeah, it was all about replicable actions, mm-hmm. right? So, right? So a superhero couldn't punch another another person. So the so the super friends always fought robots. Right. Or monsters. Yep. Right? Um, but when they got to the 80s, the rules more went about how much you could pander and sell to kids in, car- in commercials mm-hmm. and, and that stuff. That's that's kind of defined the 80s of yeah. it was the, the rules for the rules for kids code of conduct was 70s this is how i always break it down was 70s and then 80s was all about like parental code of conduct yes. like okay we now know what you're doing and we're on to you so you can't do this and it's interesting or you have to have a psa after it that 70s code of conduct actually comes into effect midway between the beginning and end of of the animated series yeah, we're at december yeah. 15th or something like that and it happens in i think early 74 so when you have well, season six or season six. <laughs> that would have been interesting. When you have season two oh, that has six episodes, um, that was more in the code of conduct. Like everything should have a moral, you know, that that's where that, that all leads into filmations, you know, kind of environmental messages and all the, you know, the going forward into the, the later 70s. Right, 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 right. Cool. So it's I, I, I almost wonder if season one would be different if it was done, it started like a year later. Hmm. Well, it would have been different because there would have been no writer's strike, and then they wouldn't have got all of the, the great writers that they did because the writer's strikes allowed, or the union allowed the writers to write one show for animation during the strike. So they were like, okay, I'd like to make some money, so sure, I'll write this. When, when was the writer's strike in the 70s? 73. Oh, wow. So okay. right when they were starting the show, and so starting this, yeah, 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 yeah. that's always that's always the case. So yeah, it always screws up something. It's it always screws up something you love. And in Next Generation, there was also a writer strike, and that kind of actually was to the detriment because they went back and they pulled out old um, scripts from Star Trek Phase Two, which was called Star Trek Two at the time, which would be confusing uh-huh. now since it, that would be the movie. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, <laughs> Devil's Do, The Child, some of those, like, season two episodes that were kind of, eh, uh, they were based off of the scripts that were written for that. But those scripts weren't all necessarily finished either, you know, because the show got right. canceled before, you know, they, I think there's eight out of 13 scripts that were actually written and the rest are just story treatments. So I think that that would be really interesting to see, you know, assuming that we could get the same writers, what they would have had to have done to change the stories that they currently had. But, uh, yeah. So I think, uh, I don't know. It feels like I think we can probably put a pin in the story part. I I feel like we've wrung every ounce of slaver trap out of that box. Yes. I feel like if you open, if you open that, that special box right now, there would be nothing in it. Like the first one. The, the empty box. Just thing. like the first. Yeah, actually, yeah. that's what we are. We are the empty box right now. Yes, there you go. Ringing every last ounce of story out of the slaver weapon isn't the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week. Here's a listen to some of the things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.fm, Standard Orbit. 
Best of Both Worlds. It's a good episode. I, episodes. I, I enjoyed it. I remember when it first took off. Family was a hundred times better to me. I'd watch Family ten times to one over watching Best of Both Worlds or Inner Light. Those are the types of things that interest me. And I do enjoy the action adventure pieces of it. I truly do. But I, I love seeing the characters. And that's why Wrath of Khan works. Warp 5. It was just mesmerizing to me. And I remember when my, my dad, a long time ago, had an airplane. He, he would take us up flying, but never, you know, we'd hold the wheel and say, hey, we're flying an airplane. But I never really was bitten by the flying bug. But it happened right there on a runway in Hawaii, on Oahu. The 602 Club. And we saw it in the first Alien as well. I mean, like the company sent them to yes. yep. to, to yep. the planet to bring that alien back, right? And uh, I, I didn't remember the part where in this film where Burke sent the the colonists to go and find the ship on his own without authority from the company. I had forgotten that part. So that was kind of an interesting revelation seeing this movie for the first time in 12 or 13 years, however long it's been since I've seen this. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. So check out the shows and get in on the daily Trek talk. You'll find them at iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, and the Windows Podcast Directory for Xbox and Zune. You can visit our website at trek.fm and view our podcast directory and stream all of our shows right from the website. We'd also like to invite you to leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Not only does it help us know how we're doing, it also helps other people find the show. Before we go, I'd like to thank our patrons, Eric Extreme and Ju Kim. Thank you so much for your support. And if you want to become an associate producer of a Trek FM show, all you need to do is become a patron of the network at the $25 or more level. Go to patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. Well, um, where can we find you when you are not on Saturday Morning Trek <laughs> uh, <laughs> or at uh, Golden can, Apple Comics? Yeah, you can. Uh, well, yeah, you can always find me at Golden Apple Comics on Saturdays, and that's at Melrose and La Brea in Los Angeles. Uh, we also, though, what I really want you to do is go out there and find me on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you find your podcasts, and look for Joe on Joe. That is my weekly G.I. Joe podcast where every week we watch one episode of The Joe Show in chronological order and we do a, like an MST3K style commentary. Aaron, you were a guest on a, yes. a great two-parter, actually literally my favorite two episodes of all time. That was fun. Uh, yeah, it is it is a lot of fun. And it was a very Mirror Universe sort of uh, episode mm-hmm. too. Totally. It's called Worlds Without End. Uh, that w- I believe it dropped in like late December. So if you're listening okay. and you want to hear Aaron on my podcast, you can certainly go there. And yeah, find me on Twitter. I'm at Joe and Joe Pod. That's on Instagram and Facebook. And send me an email at Joe and Joe Pod at gmail.com. And, you know, we just talk to you, Joe, but we also just we hang out is what it's a watch along podcast. So if you're if you're into G.I. Joe or if you have or if you never watched G.I. Joe, we describe the events of what's happening we also drop an audio at in real time as it happens on the show and it's a lot of fun yeah i found that even if i didn't follow any of the episodes necessarily or i don't remember them it was like still cool to listen yeah. to even if i wasn't watching it at the time thank so. you yeah that's i try yeah that's that's kind of the goal of it like yeah. i really like the one where we had alex who's also another person from golden apple comics who was on mm-hmm. that was fun so you yeah, know, was he great. was somebody who hadn't actually, I think, watched any GI Joe. So. Oh, he—he's a child. He's—he's he's like twenty-three <laughs> years old. Yeah, he's—he yeah, he had no GI Joe experience. He's—he's—he's he's, he's really bright, and he's—he was a great guest. I'm really, really happy to have him. But he had no idea about GI. My wife's been <laughs> on it. She doesn't. She's like, what? I don't care about GI Joe. But then we do have then we do have some friends in there who are into Joe, and so we get into some That's stuff. Cool. And we talk Transformers. We just talk all the stuff that we've been talking about. Nice. Growing up, growing up, and the things you liked when you were ten years old. That's what the show's yep. about. And you can find me on the network. I am always in the Babel Conference, which is our user listener group on Facebook. Just search for Babel Conference. And it's a private Facebook group, but uh, just message us and we'll let you write in. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Dribble, pretty much anything with art, I think, probably, uh, under Geek Filter. I'm also our network's uh, art director. All right. Well, you know, I think... It's time to leave this stasis box. I, you know, we've, we've been in here a while in the wood panel den, and I, I think that uh, we probably should go check and, and make sure that uh, cats haven't taken over the world. I would like to stay in the stasis box, please. Oh, okay. That's right. You, you can't Thank handle you. the cats. I'm very well, happy I'm going to leave this, this raw meat in here for you. Feel free to barbecue. <laughs> you know, we've, we've got a little hibachi in the corner, which from the, so you know. So if I were living in the stasis box and I ate the raw meat, would it digest? That's a good question. I don't know. 
oh my god next time on saturday morning trek remember there is an animated series didn't you say the Gazenti have legends of weapons haunted by their dead owners yes an ancient superstition <laughs> at this rate they'll never get over those old superstitions Thank you.